is going to be so cool. How cool is oh this? Oh my! Oh my God! I, uh, I'm Sean. He's speechless. That's rare. Uh, I'm Dave. No, I'm not. Not even close. This is Bar Bar Stools. I might as well start right. because I know you're going to want to introduce him. So I'm just going to tell you right from the get go. Please do. Sean would say this is a barn burner, and it truly is a barn burner. I mean, we've gone from just local folks here to a national stage to an international stage, and we're super excited to have this gentleman here tonight. Um, he's worked with the likes of the Beach Boys, Stevie Nicks, Meatloaf, uh, Karen Carpenter, Rick Wakeman, most impressively known, I guess, for his background with Billy Joel. But I'm going to let Sean bring him on because this is a, a little bit, bit of a geeky session for him. Is that fair to say? Uh, no, not at all. I, uh, uh, I'm super excited. Uh, I watched the, the, uh, the show Hired Gun on Netflix and um, a lot of cool guys in there. I watched it and I said, if I get to spend five minutes with this man, um, whatever happens the rest of my life would be great. Uh, he just came across as so cool, so chill, so introspective. And uh, I'm extremely, extremely excited to introduce Mr. Liberty DeVito. And there he is. There he is. Uh, in the flesh. <laughs> they are. I was just saying in the intro, but um, I was uh, the guys that kind of one of the last people to watch Hired Gun. And oh, okay. uh, I walked away from that. There were some cool people in it, some very cool people in it. And I walked away from that going, if I could spend five minutes with Mr. Liberty DeVito, I think I'd be a happy man. You were the star of that show, in my opinion. Well, um, I was the first one that got a call for that, you know. Uh, they were putting it together, actually, Fran Strine and uh, Five Figure Death Punch. What's his name there? Um, Jason uh, Hook. Jason Hook. Uh, they had the idea. Uh, Jason wanted to make a documentary, and Fran said, what's it about? What do you want to make it about? And Jason said, me. And Fran said, how about making it about something a little more interesting? <laughs> 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 you know, uh, so it, it became... Um, Hired guns, you know, guys that have played with guys, you know, for any length of time. And uh, somebody told Jason, if you want to do something like that, you have to interview Liberty DeVito because nobody else in history of music has played with the same guy for 30 years. You know, so um, I was the first one they called. And the biggest disappointment to me about that hired gun is what I'm wearing. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you something. I get a lot of calls to do those kind of things and they start out and they interview you and then it never happens. It, it, they run out of money, whatever it is. So I'm there wearing shorts and a, a shirt like I got on now. Everybody else, like, you, you know, uh, Rudy Cesar has got a leather jacket on and everybody's got their rock and roll clothes on. And I'm walking down the street with shorts and a t-shirt picking off <laughs> leaves off a branch, you know, that's like, Damn, I wish that was something different. <laughs> well, but I mean, when you did the uh, when you did the jam scene there, you were pretty pretty yeah. rocking looking, right? Yeah, I was wearing a, a, a faux leather coat, you know. <laughs> you know. But but you know what? For me, that came you just came across as uh, like I said in the intro, you were very chill, very introspective. For a guy that had some interesting things happen to him in the course of your career, I didn't get a lot of business, and maybe you're holding back on that. But it was just the way that you conveyed the story was just uh it didn't come it didn't come up come come off as some guy that would you know want to unload it, I, I was impressed with that no it's just uh you know uh it was my story of what happened between me and billy kind of you know it was nothing worse than that nothing better than that and uh you know uh, Ferran actually gave us a uh, uh, me and russell Davers, who it happened to too uh a, a stage to vent and tell our side of the story because you know everybody automatically believes what the star of the show says whether it be billy bon jovi whoever it is if 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 he says something about the god that he just uh cut loose people believe him you know and my biggest yep. deal deal was in the beginning when they when i got cut loose it was because of musical differences i hate that term musical differences <laughs> it's like that's bull because the guy who take, took my place and does the shows now he's playing exactly what i you know the parts i created how can right. be musical differences you know right so let me have a question for you if you don't so, yeah 
I, I'm just kind of curious because I mean, this whole hired gun concept seems to have taken flight, and you know, and I see it even here in Halifax, where you might have a star of a show, and he has you know a, a slew of people that he goes to for a guitar player or a drummer or, or a fill in, you know, bass player, whatever the case may be. But it, what happened to the days? And I'm sure when you were starting to play, there was a band. Y'all were the same caliber, the same. You know, you started off with a mission together. What changed? Do you think? Well, what happened, what, you know, in the beginning, when, when the way I got into the band was, um, well, I had a band called Topper, right? We, it was me, Russell Jabbers, uh, Doug Stegmeyer, and Howie Emerson. That, that was Topper. Now, uh, Doug got hired to do Billy Joel's Street Life Serenaded Tour. Well, on that tour, Billy said he wanted to move from California back to New York wanted to take Doug with him and wanted to use the same, same guys in the studio as that went on the road with him. At the time when he did Piano Man and Street Life, he was using studio musicians and then going on the road with a totally different band. He wanted the same guys to record and go on the road with him. And, and I had known Billy since I was like 17 years old. We used to cross in the clubs and stuff like that. We played the same band, same club. Uh, and um, so I got hired. We went in to do Turnstiles, the, the first album, me, Doug, and Billy. That was it. When Billy listened back to a couple of songs, like Miami 2017, he goes, you know, we could use some guitars on this. So we said, well, we know guitar players, Russell and Howie. So that band became Billy's band. So we were a band for years before we played with Billy. So you're right about that. A band came in and became, you know, we, you could say that we actually got a piano player and singer to come in, in the band top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair but, enough. But Billy had the record deal, you know? Um, yeah. So, yeah, you did, that, he did get that band sound because that's what we were. We were a band before that. You know, with the, it, with the inclusion of Richie Canada to play sax, who was also another Long Island guy that everybody knew. And uh, so everybody was familiar with each other. We're all from the same place, you know, you get the same guys from Halifax that play and somebody writes a song about the local area and you can relate. You all get so, it, right. out in, yeah, yeah, he's out in LA recording albums about Long Island and, and guys in LA <laughs> yeah. can't relate, you know? Yeah, 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 for sure. So, yeah. Um, so you mentioned, you know, you said the guy who's playing with them now is, you know, playing the same parts, but I would say, no, he's not because, a lot of what you recorded, um, and I've had the opportunity to play some of your parts, and you're not an easy guy to replicate. You can get the sound, but you've got a feel and a vibe the way you do things that um, you'll play on it, you'll go back and you'll listen, and you'll go like, man, I hope he never hears this because it's not the same at all. <laughs> um, you know, and platoons, like um, you reference only the good die young a couple of times and, and right. the intro to that. Uh, that's one of my favorite tunes. Um, that you played on and a key drummer question are you playing a shuffle throughout that uh yeah it's uh, not yeah. on my foot not on my foot when we did okay. it live i did play the shuffle on my foot all the way through but now you know there's only three things you could do on the drums it's one is a single stroke roll the other is a double stroke roll and the other is a rough those are the three things that we do everything is made up of those right, right? so you have to you know a good drummer's bar or great steel so yeah. only the guy young. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. John, you're a great drummer now. I, I, I stole only good that day, only good that young from Mitchell, who played with Jimi Hendrix. Uh, nice. Now, I say it in the book, too. Um, if you listen to uh, 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 Up From The Skies on the Axis Bulbers Love album, you know that album you're familiar with? Yes, Axis sir. Bulbers? First, he starts off with he's talking like a Martian. He comes from out of space, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you relate to it. And then at the end, his guitar, it makes it sound like he's taken off. And, uh, you know, the voice is like, oh, but, but, but. And you hear, boo, boo, boo. And then it kind of fades out. And then you hear, yeah. Same groove as Only a Good Day Young and same fill in the beginning. You know, interesting. My, my other one, favorite one, uh, moving out of the groove on that is just uh, unreal. I don't know if people have talked to you about that before, but I just find it's really hard. I don't know if you recorded it with the click track when you did it, but it was just so. No, no, no click track. 
And the thing with the mistake that people make, as I see them play it all the time, I get all these tapes all the time, you know, guys' videos, like, hey, this is me playing you, you know, it's, I always say like, that's pretty good. You know, I don't want to say like, wow, that's really bad, man. You're way <laughs> off, you know. <laughs> but um, the mistake that, that guys make in uh, uh, Move It Out is they think I'm playing the sixth the hi-hat, like, da, 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 yeah. da. no, I'm just playing straight A. It's like, da, da, ba, da, 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 ba. Because Billy's going, ding, 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 ding. Yeah. And I have to do it, you know. And it's that's the groove so nicely. Yeah, and it's just a two and four, boom, blah, boom, blah, you know? Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's simple. Like, the way you are is really, really a simple beat. You know, we had to create something different, though, because we didn't want to be uh, uh, like Elton John, you know? So Daniel was kind of that kind of same cup of song. But um, so I up with something different. And between me and Phil Ramone, we came up with that beat of Just The Way You Are. And people have call, called it the hardest simple beat to play. Yeah, I would agree with that for sure. And all, yeah. you all, in parts of it, you almost feel like you got to fall off your chair to, to hit, the, hit the snare. It's, it's so in the pocket laid back, right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, really cool. And that groove came off the guitar. You know, like I, I listened to the rhythm of the guitar and it was like, yeah, the brush went really well with the guitar. You know, it's the sound. It was all about the sound too. You know, so that's. Does it come naturally to you, though, Liberty? Does it? Like, you just hear something in your head, like just something inspires you, and you just come off with it, or, or you have to give it some thought. Well, I I don't read music, and I don't write. I never took lessons, so it's like, yeah, whatever pops into my head. My uh, records were my books growing up. You know, I listened to everything, everything. You know, uh, and one of the greatest gigs I had was playing weddings. So you had to play all different kinds of ethnic music. Right. You know, uh, so I, I say it in the book, too. I, I talk about the first time I played a wedding. I walked in and this guy, if young was 100 years old and could barely hold up his accordion, you know, and I'm the rock star. You know, I'm, my hair's down to here and, and I was uh, like 20 years old. And, and I thought, man, this is insane. This is going to be ridiculous, right? And a, and a guy turns around, the trumpet player turns around, and he says, the bride wants to start merengue. I was like, what the <laughs> hell is a merengue? You know, so I stayed there for two and a half years playing weddings, learning all that stuff you didn't know. And you're challenged because they call songs and you got to play them. Yeah. You know, whether it's you're learning how to swing, just not doing anything else with your left hand, but you're learning how to swing, you know? Really interesting to do. Um, so talk about your book, because uh, your guy Andy sent us a, a nice little sort of precursor in the email, and um, a friend yeah. of ours up here just 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 bought it. And um, Tell us about the book. The book. The book. The book, uh, you know, I started out uh, writing a, um, the history of my family, actually, for my children to have. You know, I have four daughters and, and I wanted them to have the, the history of my family. And I started with my grandparents coming over from Italy, you know, and I was, my, my father lived till he was 91 years old and my mother 89 years old. So I got to interview them. And I also got to interview a couple of my aunts, you know, and I found out a lot about my family. And um, what, what, it, what it turned out to be was, I thought, like, let me um, make this about me growing up and what it was like growing up. And then when I got cut from Billy, I thought, okay, I'm gonna throw in some of the Billy stuff too about the business and what it's like. So then it turned into like, this is my road that I took to go from immigrants to playing with one of the biggest single artists ever. You know, a lot of guys that you see videos and stuff like that, and, and they're like, well, I went to Berkeley School of Music, and, and, you know, I was guaranteed that I'd become a rock star when I got out of Berkeley, and I, you know, I could play paradiddles in 75 uh, different uh, positions, uh, you know. <laughs> but, no, I, I'm not like that. You know, it wasn't like that. I uh, took uh, many roads. Uh, some of them were good. Some of them were very dark. And at the end, the, the story turned out to be, Liberty DeVito, and then the other line that runs parallel with that, the life of Billy Joel's drummer, you know, and when they crisscrossed, sometimes it was really dark, 
right? Oh, uh, it leads to divorce. Um, I took some dark roads that I was fortunate enough to get out of. Uh, uh, like Doug Stegmaier, our bass player, you know, he didn't make it off the road and, uh, you know, lost his life because of it. And, you know, uh, stuff like that. So it's that kind of story. It's like a continuation of Hired Gun, but it's a completion in the fact that I reunited with Billy again. I'm not playing with him, but he's my friend again. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's 30 years of your life, um, brother. You can't, you can't get that time back. That's 30 years in, right? Yeah, 30 years in. What happened was we, we got inducted, myself, Richie Canada, Russell Chavez, and the late Doug Stegmaier got inducted into the Long Island Music Hall of Fame. Now, I, at the time, I was still upset of things, very angry. And I said, I'm going. But, I, you know, I wasn't listening to the music anymore. If it came on the radio, I would turn it off. But um, because of the other guys, I went. As a matter of fact, I even sent somebody else to do the sound check. I said, you go, I'm not going. You know? <laughs> so they wanted us to play one song. It turned into five songs. The crowd went nuts, you know, because it was the original guys that played on the record now, and they're hearing that. And uh, so after the show, we thought, like, you know, we should be doing this because there's a lot of tribute bands out there that are playing our parts and making, you know, serious go about with this. So... When I started to learn the songs again, I started to fall in love with the music again. And I started to think about what it was like in the studio, you know, and what it was like to go on the road. So that's why that was real easy to write down all that stuff from song right. to song, because uh, I go through the uh, chronologically through the albums and what it was like to record the songs. And um, but the only thing I didn't have was the friend that I looked in his eyes every night, you know, when we played. He called me up and would ask me if I like this thing he's writing. And I would either tell him, yeah, it's great. Continue to write it. Or, no, it sucks, man. Go back to the drawing board. You know, stuff like that. And um, so one night, laying in bed, I thought, you know, this, this war has got to stop. Because we were dissing each other on, in, in uh, interviews. And um, I emailed him. And he emailed me back immediately and said, yeah, I, I was a little upset about the way it ended, too. So we met for breakfast and uh, we kind of buried the hatchet. We didn't talk about anything from the past that was bad. We just talked about like friends that we lost, uh, what we're doing now, you know, children, our children. And so it was a great talk, just talking to an old friend again. That's and awesome. so uh, he's back, you know. Well, I don't that's know if we'll, we'll ever play. I don't know if we'll ever play again, but together, but you know. Well, hopefully that does happen because, I mean, uh, all that aside, when you're going through that stuff, it must be pretty darn cool to know that you were part of an awful lot of songs that, you know, are not only world famous, but so many people know, love, listen to all the time. I mean, that's got to be a pretty good feeling. Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a great feeling, but the greatest feeling is, uh, for me, is when somebody comes up to me and goes, you know, when, when I met Ringo, I, I shook his hand and I said, you know, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now. And he said, well, at least you're not blaming me for it. You know, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah. But um, so when somebody comes up to me and says, I saw you play and that was it for me. I wanted to play the drums. You know, I saw you. I went to see a Billy Joel, but I couldn't take my eyes off you. You changed my life. And I, I'm happy that you were the drummer at the time that made me become the drummer that I am now. And a lot of these guys are in big bands now, you know, like big names, you know, like Foo Fighters and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, and um, so that really touches me more than, um, you know, Grammys and the God. That's all cool. But when somebody, when you influence somebody, that, that's, a, that's great. great. Well, well, I certainly, that I, I, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I certainly feel like I owe you a royalty check or two because I definitely lifted a number of your, your chops on some stuff that I did. So <laughs> well, thank you for that. Well, that's the, that's the thing about the drums. You know, I, I even say I, all the stuff I'm telling you, I say in the book, too. You know, um, we are the we, a band is only as good as the drummer. That's, how, that's what I feel anyway. Yeah, and, all right. Don't get them going, Jesus. You know, and, and you know, if. If you disagree with me, that means you're a piano player or a guitar player or a bass player or a singer. Exactly, or a bass player. <laughs> you know, uh, so um, because, look, you can go and, and, and see a band and the guitar player is shredding and he's great and the bass player is great, but the drummer kind of sucks and you're like, 
Yeah, the, 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 the guitar player was great and the bass player was great, but the band sucked because the drummer isn't doing it. You mm -hmm. walk into a garage and there's these young kids there and they're banging away and the drummer is going for it like it's the last time he's ever going to play. The guitar player might not be any good, but you walk away and you go, they rocked, man. They rocked. Yeah, that's but true. The drummer was doing it, you know? So, um, but the music gods are fair. We have no melody. We can't copyright anything. So, you know, when you say like, I owe you royalties, no, you don't. We, we don't have, we do that. I think, I think the guy would have a problem trying to copyright wipe out. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't think he could do it. I think the guitar player would get the copyright for the day. You know? Well, I'm not saying I'm going to send you royalties. I said I owe you royalties. <laughs> <laughs> and, but, you much, and you would much rather owe it to me than cheat me out of it, right? <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and I, I would never do that because, like I said, there's so many, so many licks and so many chops that, I mean, memorable. Not, well, not noodling well, and hack. I mean, they mean well, something. Well, I'm as guilty as you are. I've taken, I mean, the nylon curtain, Ringo's all over that, you know. I mean, I've, I channeled, channeled Ringo uh, in that whole record, you know. Oh, listen, he was the real deal. I mean, we talk about that a lot. I mean, there's so many different players. And yeah, I'm a bass player, but I appreciate drummers, Lord God in heaven, I do. But it, there's so many drummers that necessarily weren't the most the most flair, but had the most feel. And, and Ringo was it for me, too. Because, yeah. and Sean, I'll say that, too, with Don Henley. And uh, who's the other one you talk about a lot, Sean? This is hard to emulate. It sounds simple, but it's really not. You know, it, it's this perfect timing, perfect groove. Right. Well, it's, the, it's, it's how you grow up, too, the way uh, you play. The person that you become is how you grow up. Anybody, even if you don't play an instrument, the person you become is what you grew up with from your youth growing up. You become that person. You know, I played with a bunch of guys up there in, in um, Halifax, way up, way up. I mean, like it, this, the end of the world. Where did the planes land on 11 um, in Canada? Gander, Newport. Newfoundland. Yes. I played with a bunch of guys up there. I flew down and played with them. They were great. And the music, when they sent me the music that they were going to do, it was like, this is Irish music. You know, it sounds like Irish, but it's their culture. Right. You know, you know it's how they grew up. And it was fantastic to do, you know. So I, that, that's what I believe. I believe that you grow up, you could see uh, a Latin, a, a, a white guy from America or anywhere trying to play Latin music. Okay, he knows the parts. But then you go see a guy that comes from Cuba or a guy that comes from South America and he's playing the same thing. And you're like, holy cow. Yeah. yeah. He grew up listening to that since he was an infant. Yeah. You know, it's a big difference. It's in I grew DNA. Up in a, yeah. Yeah. I get it, it. It's in your DNA. Me and Billy grew up in a, in a, a blue collar neighborhood and we played blue collar music. You know, I think that's, that was a big part of our success that we stuck to what we knew. It's, uh, it's like it's like we rehearsed because I wanted to ask you about the Long Island scene. I've heard a lot about it. I've heard what it was like back in the '70s. But just if for for anybody that hasn't experienced or don't doesn't know about it, just tell what it's all about. Well, back in the '60s when I was growing up, uh, gee, there was um, the Vanilla Fudge was huge, and there was right. all kinds of bands like them. You know, uh, the Vanilla Fudge, the Illusion. There was a place called the Action House that used to go to. I remember seeing Chicago, uh, Chicago Transit Authority on the small stage. I saw traffic there. I saw Spencer Davis group there. I saw Blue Cheer there, you know, um, all those kind of bands. And, and you used to stand in the front row and, and you, you, know, you lean on the stage and you're watching these bands and you're learning as you're watching, you know? And um, yeah, the Long Island scene was pretty crazy. And um, there was a lot of people came from there. I mean. I, I don't know if more musicians or more comedians came from Long Island. You know, you had, you had Rodney Dangerfield, uh, Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. You know, yeah. a lot of a lot of people came from Long Island. You know, it was, it so, was, it was a great thing. Your career, I mean, you pretty much drummed through the seventies. I mean, I was looking at your at your bio today. I said, like, "Oh my God, who didn't he play with?" I mean, so we all know the Billy Joel story, but I don't think I knew about Carly Simon or Stevie Nicks or me. Yeah. With the Beach Boys, I didn't know any of that stuff. Yeah, Paul McCartney, 
Oh, that was cool. Wait a minute, back up the train. What do you mean, Paul McCartney? Yeah, I, we did two songs uh, with Paul. We went in the studio with Paul and did two songs. Uh, it was really cool to meet an idol, you know? I mean, meeting Ringo was really cool because he was a Beatle, but then meeting Paul was like meeting God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, uh, to be honest with you, I had to back out of the room after I shook his hand, recompose myself because I was like, I was like a little girl, like, <laughs> like oh my God. <laughs> you know but um it was great to play with him because we did two songs and in between the two songs he was playing piano on, a, on the on the session and we did like little richard and uh, uh jerry lee lewis he was singing all that stuff man and it was great just just jamming out with him and then when we uh, had lunch it was great we just talked about children he was just a great guy to hang out with you know um so yeah that was really cool and the song that i play on I know that he just put out Flaming Pie, a really big box with a bunch of stuff in it. And the song that I'm on is In Box. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. yeah. So we want to be mindful of your time. Yeah, and we, so we're, we're coming down to the end here. But um, this, is good, I, this is good. This is good. This is good. Well, and I'm, is I'm, I'm totally enjoying it. Yeah, well, um, I'll keep going a little bit. Well, I, I tell uh, you, I, you, 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 you was, the sign was uh, scratch your nose when you're ready to wrap there, Mr. DeVito. Or we're, happy <laughs> yeah, to go. We're, we're good. We're having a good time. We're having a good time. Usually, you totally. Come, sometimes um, you come into some of these things and it's like, oh, shit, man. You know? <laughs> no, you know, it, we, we, started, uh, we started this about three months ago. There was an awful lot of, sh I won't say shitty, but I will say bad stuff that happened in Nova Scotia. And we just, it was just a way for people to kind of have a little bit of fun and, uh, so we're we're very mindful and respectful of not being negative and trying to keep it on the up high. So hopefully you're getting that. So um, how good are, how are you guys making out in this pandemic? I mean, well the numbers are not good. too bad in our area. Like the numbers are good. Uh, what Sean's referring to is we had like some you know there was a one of the worst mass shooting in Canada's history happened here in April, and yeah. and it was it was just that combined with the global pandemic combined with the you know, a fire plane going down that, you know, was a friend of, uh, of ours, their, their daughter says, like, is this so much shit <laughs> that happened? And it's like, yeah. man, it's like, what do we do? We got to do something. And uh, we said, well, we, yeah. we just heard this show and we wanted to talk to people like yourself, talk to anybody that we can shine a light on the positivity and just maybe just try to distract people a little bit. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, before myself, the pandemic, I mean, when it first hit, you know, I, we live in me, it's me and my wife and I have a three-year-old daughter plus the other three that are in their forties and thirties, you know? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so the three of us live in a, in an apartment in Brooklyn. So in the beginning of the quarantine, we didn't go out. And I'm, I'm telling you now, me and my wife will last forever because we made it through that. <laughs> <laughs> For, with a three-year-old kid. Absolutely. With, Amen, with a three-year-old. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think this, this marriage is going to work. <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Um, you have a sister? A friend... <laughs> oh, my God. Um, yeah. A friend of mine uh, gave me a little trivia tip here, and I hopefully I don't blow it, and we'll see where it goes. But okay. he told me you have a connection to Halifax in a weird sort of way. Um, one of your daughters is an actress, is she not? Yes, she is. Yes, she is. She, Tori, yeah. She was in – a Hallmark movie with a gentleman by the name of Steve Lund, yes. who is from our area here. He actually played junior hockey uh, for the Halifax Mooseheads and um, had to retire because of, of uh, he was a singer in a band, but he got a concussion. And so your daughter was in a movie with him. So you've got, that's the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. I don't know if you knew that or not, but. Well, I think, I think my daughter had mentioned something about a guy that played hockey or yep. something, of the moose heads or something like that. Yeah, it yep. was a Christmas movie, right? Yeah, That's right, 100%. Yeah. I don't even know that because uh, my, my wife watches them all the time. And it was like, I think it was on a couple weeks ago. And, and anyway, I, I, I know Steve Lund a little bit just through hockey. But so there you go. There's a connection to Halifax you didn't know you knew. Now, you talk about crap. People love that crap. I mean, my daughter is on a, a show called uh, Chicago Meb that, that is, is good, you know. But that Halifax, I mean, that... Uh, uh, Hallmark stuff. I, I have a hard time sitting and watching it. <laughs> well, we know how it's going to yeah. end every time, right? So, yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, it's going to yeah. end a happy ending, you know, a couple yeah. of Christmas balls might break, and uh, you know, 
<laughs> Nobody's yeah. gonna die. Nobody's gonna get shot. No monsters are in it. You know. Yeah. So um, you're uh, we, we're having a little bit of hard, hard time winding this up, and I don't ask you to name names, but you've been doing some recording. You've been in the studio recently. Yeah. Yep. Um, how's that working out with obviously all the, the, the things that are going, cause New York was hit very hard by, by all this, right? In, in the beginning, it was really, really bad. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, our governor, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like him. I kind of like him. I love uh, him. he, he, uh, set it up well. And, uh, you know, it's all about, we, we, yeah, he said today in a, in, in a, uh, uh, conference news conference, he said, people say I did a great job. He said, I didn't do anything. I just recommended something. All the people in New York City and state wore masks. We all wore masks. You know, this stuff about, I don't want to wear it. It's a constitutional right. I shouldn't have to wear it. It's not about that, man. It's about like, I care about you. You care about me. Let's yeah, wear a mask right. or we don't get sick. You know? Right. So that's what New York did. And our numbers went, went way down. Then we were going to open up again to restaurants. And he said, no, too early. And California did and uh, Florida did, and they're suffering now because they opened too early, you know? I, I was listening to Howard Stern yesterday, and he says, this is such bullshit. It's like, people just, just wear the mask for six to eight weeks, wear it, go into isolation. This will be gone, you know, if we all yeah. did the same thing, you know? So. And that's kind of what happened here. I mean, like, we literally shut down. Now, I was fortunate. I get to do uh, my first gig in five months, two weeks ago, Actually, yeah. right around where right around where Sabian is, um, but it was a lot different. Like minimum people in the bar, everybody had to sit at a table. There was no dancing. There was nothing like that. Um, right. But it was fun. It was fun to be out again. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the, the the band that I'm in that the Lord of Fifty Second Street, uh, we're doing a gig at the end of August. It's a part. It's a drive-in gig. Okay. So, oh, nice. Yeah, we did one a uh, couple of weeks ago. But it kind of got rained out halfway through, so we didn't get to finish the whole set. But, um, you know, they're cool. It's just, you know, people start clapping. You don't hear them. You just see their arms moving. You know? <laughs> that's that's kind of weird. But, uh, yeah, I just want to play. And then yeah, being yeah. in the studio, we, uh, Richie Canada has a studio, Cove City. It's uh, out on Long Island. It's steady the art. It, it's still got the big room, the big control room, the knee boards, everything, you know. So I'm kind of the house drummer out there. And uh, so when we went out there, we were out of masks. And then when you're playing, you're, you're definitely more than six feet away from the guy next to you because yeah. the studio is so big. So, uh, you know, it was cool. You sometimes forget when you go back into control room to put your mask back on again. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. But, uh, you know, so, so um, but yeah, you got to play. You know, we, we, and we're human. We're human. We, we need other human contact. When we, This is so weird not being able to, you know, smile at somebody walking down the street or, you know, hug somebody. Or, you know, oh, that's a God, it's just yeah. weird. It's I was going to ask you that, Liberty, because, I mean, you're the, you're the guy. Like, let's be honest. I mean, you're, a, you know, a, a drum legend, and you've been doing this for a long time. Can you take away live music for, from an audience? Like, like I, don't, I don't know. I don't get it. I can't see it. And we talk to a lot of people, and I just don't see it without that connection, that, that, that interaction. What's the new normal look like for Liberty? Like, I don't know. What do you think? Well, I think live music will come back. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it'll come back this year, you know, until they find a vaccine. When, once they find a vaccine, then everybody's going to go, okay, that's cool. You know, if I get sick, I'll get a shot or whatever. Uh, then it's going to come back. And I think people are so sick of staying home that it's rush, like, mm. out there. And, uh, you know, a lot of bands are going to be playing again. It's going to be great. I mean, a lot of bands had to cancel. Uh, the bigger bands that play like the Coliseums and the arenas and stuff like that, they had to cancel. And they, they can't get started until the end of 2021 because the production is so much that it takes time. It takes six months, almost a year to put it together. Right. You know? But little bands like ours, boom, we'll be... We'll be uh, Back in the saddle. We've got some stuff lined up for next year, definitely. And That's October, awesome. too. A, lot of, a couple of these uh, driving things. Maybe. That's fantastic. Um, before, before we lose you, i got to geek out just for a second. What are you, what are you playing these days for gear? What's, uh, what's your weapons of choice? Well, of course, uh, Fabian Symbols. Yep. You know, which, my favorite uh, uh, brand that they make is Artisan. The Artisan. Yep. Uh, 
which I like to do. I use them in my band. I have another band called the Slim Kings, and we, we kind of do like uh, hip hop ish rock kind of stuff. And uh, the artisans work well, but they're kind of um, soft. So they, um, you can't really hit them. You have to hit them with respect. Yeah, yeah. Where, the, where the AAs, I can slam them to death, you know, and nothing happens to them. So with the Lord of the Second Street, we do all the Billy Joel songs. I'm using the, the AAs, you know, uh, 21 inch ride, uh, 18, 19 you know, um, 15 inch high hats, which I love. Um, heads, Evans, Evans heads. I've uh, been using the hydraulics, blue ones. Yep. You know, uh, love them. Um, sticks, Promark, because, you know, it's Promark, Evans, they're together now. And uh, drums, there's a company from England called Liberty Drums. <laughs> mm. Interesting. And, uh, they're a boutique company. They've been around for about 12 years now. And I just love the sound of them. I've gone from a uh, 22 inch bass drum to a 24, which I mm. really like. It's got nice. more of a boom to it. And I'm back, I started out with them with just the uh, one up and two down, you know, one tom, two floor toms. And, and now I just, uh, I, they just sent me uh, three toms in front now and two floors. Yeah, so yeah, this is from that's, that's sort of similar to, you got yeah, really, a bit of an elaborate setup in the day. Yeah, I had four up front for a while. Yeah. It was like crazy. I saw, I, saw, I, I saw a picture, geez, a couple of weeks ago, and it looked like you had a, your hi hat was almost underneath one of the toms. Well, it's, it was really close. You know, yeah. my hi hat, the symbol kind of just comes over the snare too. It gets, I like it close to me. You know, with the four toms, it was really weird. We had the, in the Coliseums, the stage was set up where uh, I was up higher than the guitar players were on a, on a riser. And then it was steps that went up to that riser. And underneath there, there was like a, a, a curtain that, that my roadie could see if anything would, would go wrong. The guitar tech had a, a, a hydra underneath the stage and a popcorn machine, you know, had all this stuff. <laughs> so sometimes when I'm playing, the last floor tom, which was the 16 inch, the, the, the sound guys were calling it the coffee table because you barely ever get to it, you know, and, and they sometimes like during, she's always moving to me, there would be hot dogs or pizza <laughs> on that. Thing. And, and because I don't play, I can eat. <laughs> that's a, that's a good, that's a, that's a good idea. It's a good use if you're not going to get to hit it. Right. Right. The coffee table, they called it. <laughs> yeah. You're going to use the coffee table tonight. I probably won't get there. <laughs> Let That's me ask you now, Liberty, what's, so go back to the Billy Joel years, and again, I'm going to give you my two favorite, 52nd Street and Glass Houses, but what was your favorite album you've recorded on from start to finish? Well, they all have different meanings to me. I mean, Turnstiles, because it was the first one yeah. with Billy, even though it did, it stepped, you know, it sold like 50,000 copies in the beginning, and it wasn't until The Stranger of 52nd Street came out that it actually went gold and then platinum. But um, The Stranger, because Phil Ramone, that's the first one, Phil. Yeah, well, mm. That was like a learning experience, just being with this great person who had produced Frank Sinatra and so many others, Paul Simon, all that kind of crap. But um, I think uh, The Nile and Curtain, my favorites, because I really like the songs that are on it. And, you know, Billy always changes uh, when, we, when we play album to album. Like The Stranger was kind of like the, the pop, let's make a hit, let's get on the, on the, on the uh, playing field. And then 52nd Street was more jazz You know, we did that big swing thing in the middle of Zanzibar. And, and the Glass Houses was the rock band, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, a, an introduction to his version of, of punk and, and like the, the police stuff and, and the clock and all that stuff that was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. But then uh, Nylon Curtain, you know, that, that we, Billy went into Glass Houses and when we first started recording it, he was, I want bar band. Just play. I like playing, you know? So that's what we did. Glass Houses is kind of like a bar band. With Nylon Curtain, he went and he goes, I don't want you to have to think about how you're going to duplicate it live. Just, we're going to put on this record what belongs on this record, how to make a great record. Like the Beatles knew that they didn't have to play anymore live, so they could do Strawberry Feels mm, at great. the time, stuff like that. 
without having to think about like, how are we going to duplicate this live? You know? So that's what we do it now on curtain. And then, you know, tried to figure it out once it was done, how we're going to do it live. You know? But it was cool. So that was cool. Innocent Man was cool. It took us two and a half weeks to do the basic tracks. Billy turned to me and said, this is going to bomb. It was too much fun to make. You know? <laughs> but it didn't. <laughs> no. Luckily. and Right. And I mean, you know, he, he and he's, I tell you, he's, he's a guy too who's had ebbs and flows of his career, obviously. And he, his story's interesting in its own right. Yeah. Um, but so... I guess without getting too personal about this stuff, because you covered it in Hired Guns, so I don't want to duplicate it, but you're out of a gig. Um, yeah. And I, and I have to say, you know, hopefully people have said this to you before. You didn't come off as bitter or whatever at all in that, in that documentary. But, I mean, what's going through your mind, man? You got, you got kids, you got, you know, you got bills to pay, and you're going, like, what the hell am I going to do? Like, what, what, what was going on for you when that took place? Well, you, I was living in a bubble for 30 years. It's a bubble you're in. You can get yep. in trouble. And the law goes, ha, ha, oh, you play with Billy Joel. Oh, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Go, go, go. And, uh, yeah, so right. what, what you did with that person. And, you know, yeah. Uh, so when that bubble burst, it was like, oh, my God, what do I do now? I'm not that person I was yesterday. I'm not Billy Joel's drummer anymore. And people were calling me and, and, and saying, hey, I heard you guys are playing in uh, Cincinnati. Can we hook up? I'm not with him anymore. I'm out, you know. So mm -hmm. that was hard getting back. And as a matter of fact, it wasn't until uh, one of the guys from Sabian, uh, uh, Wayne Blanchard, who um, used to work for Sabian, still, he moved back to England, so he doesn't work with them anymore. It's just his own production thing. Uh, he said to me, he goes, I said, what can I do? I got to get back, you know, get myself together here and, and go on living, you know. He said, okay, the first thing you have to do is to stop saying you were, you were the drummer for Billy Joel. You were formerly the drummer for Billy Joel. Because what you are is, you are the guy that Billy Joel chose to make those unforgettable hit records and those amazing live tours. That's who you are. And once I grabbed onto that, it was like, okay, that's cool because I'm always there. Turn that's on the right. radio, see from the time restaurant comes on, that's me. That's not the new guy, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. you know, uh, so I, I kind of built from there. And uh, then I started to get calls for gigs and stuff like that but with other people. You know, did a lot with Ronnie Spector for a year and a half. Was in the house band at the, at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame for a long time with a bunch of other guys from other bands, you know? So we had a lot of fun. It became fun then when I didn't right. have to think about like, oh, what was me? I'm not Billy Joel's drummer anymore, you know? That'd be weird, though. I mean, your identity would be 30 years as yes. Billy Joel's drummer. But that's a cool perspective to look at. You're the guy he chose, you know, and that's, that's really yeah. awesome. That, that's, that's a really fresh perspective. Good on you, man. Well, I know you guys didn't get the book, but, in the, you know, he wrote the forward to the book. We're, we're going to freaking buy the book now. I'm going to buy the book tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, we're going to. Book. You better buy the book. Oh, uh, we're going to buy it, brother. Trust me. You know, you know he actually gives me my do in the, in the forward, you know, like how I changed his songs and, you know, uh, he, he was limited on piano and how rock ability made these things a hit, you know? So it, it was great. His forward is great. Once you get the, you, once you stop crying, then you can read the rest of the book. That'd be awesome. <laughs> and you know, Dave and I were, Dave and I were talking just before, and there's a, there's a part in higher gun where you talk about giving back some of the stuff that you're yeah. doing with the, yeah. Giving back to you know, instruments for kids and stuff. Talk about that a little bit because people might yeah. not know that. Little Kids Rock. Little Kids Rock. It's a great little organization. It uh, goes into the schools in, in underprivileged areas where the music uh, curriculum has been taken out. And they actually teach teachers how, you know, like a, a history teacher or something, how to play the guitar, for instance. Um, they'll their, their mission is to teach a kid one chord and he can play 25 songs. Teach him the second chord in a progression, 50 songs. Mm. Teach him the third chord, the full progression of, he can play 150 songs. Yeah. You know, teach them what they want to know today, what they want to know. And um, so it was started by a guy named Dave Wish. He's the CEO of Little Kids Rock. He was.
out in California, so these kids hanging around, he said, hey, look, if you kids come, uh, I'll give you lessons for free. He started out with 20 kids, over a half a million kids in the United States. I went to um, school there. It was fantastic, you know, and to hand a kid an mm -hmm. instrument and go, if you study this for a year, you can keep this instrument. You keep it for free, you know? And um, so it's been real good. We do a gala every year uh, with, with some great ones. Last, last year we did with um, um, uh, Steve Miller, who was great. Uh, we, uh, Asha was there. You know, there's so many people. Bonnie Ray supports it. B.B. Uh, uh, King used to, you know, when he was alive, he was part of it. So it's, it's a really great thing to be a, a part of. You know, that's amazing yeah it's it, fun and it's funny how music usually is you know yeah. it's it's the thing that you know people just think it's going to keep coming back and keep coming back and it doesn't no. get the support and I, i'm sure you're yeah. seeing it down there um and it's frustrating it really, it really is. is frustrating i mean uh my daughter who's the actress she plays violin and um you know, she, she came to a rehearsal with, with Billy when we were doing the Stormfront tour. And we, there's that song, Down East Through Alexa, on the Stormfront album, which has a violin on it. So this woman we hired to play the violin, my daughter saw it when she was probably six years old. And she said, I want to do that. And she stuck with it. And she's still playing that violin. You know, it's, uh, it, it's just, it's like learning another, well, you know, it's like learning another language. Yeah, you know, yeah 100%. When, when you learn an instrument, you know. Well, and it's the one thing that everybody really needs and gravitates to, and it's the one thing that gets the crap kicked out of it more than anything else, in my opinion, right? It, it really does. I mean, look what happened to, to, on the internet now. You know, if everybody wants to, you to give your music away for free. It's like, what are you kidding me? This is how we make a living. 100%. You know? 100%. When, the plumber, when, when the plumber comes to your house, tell them to fix the toilet for free. Yeah, you know, exactly. Well, 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 you'll get you know exposure. What? We'll get you some exposure for your plumbing business. Exactly. You can just do it for free. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. You're not. You're not. You're not paying for that performance. You're paying for the years and years and years it took you to get there. And people don't understand that, right? Right. That's what Phil X said in, in Hired Gun when he said, I, "They're not giving me three hundred bucks to play on that tune today. They're giving me three hundred bucks for the experience that I had mm -hmm. learning all that stuff." You know? 100%. And the and you sacrifice should... too. We talk about that a lot. The, the stuff you give up to do this shit. You know, like you missed your prom. You missed your, your yeah. This... Yeah date you miss you know your wedding you miss what you miss whatever because you know this is yeah. your craft this is what you do yeah yeah it's unbelievable you ever get a sick day no yeah exactly yeah right. you know i'm not coming to the gig tonight i don't feel good what <laughs> right exactly <laughs> yeah. or you you might get replaced if you you know if you don't show up a couple times right people just yeah. they don't understand and it's um you know, it's unfortunate because like here, for example, I mean, the bars are closed down. Everybody was getting a government this or a government that. Yeah. And so many musicians were getting nothing. Nothing. Zero. Nothing. nothing. Yeah. Right. That's why you need a lot of passion for what you're doing to, to stick with it. Because 100%. It's going to come back. Yeah, you absolutely. know, I always tell kids, I always tell people, you know, like, yeah, it was cool playing. It's cool playing Madison Square Garden in front of about 15,000 people and stuff like that. But sometimes I would look at Billy and I'd be really pissed at him, you know, and, and I didn't want to be there at that moment where you get some guys, you know, they, they, you call that success, but you get some guys that are in, get together maybe once a week on a, on a Friday night, they go in somebody's basement, they pop a couple of beers, they start to play cover tunes and they're having the time of their life. Mm -hmm. They are more successful at that moment than I am being pissed off at Billy Joel on stage and not wanting to be there. Isn't that crazy? You know, you know it's funny yeah. you say that. Dave and I went to a party on, uh, on Saturday night yeah. and uh, it was at a friend of ours house and her son's band was playing. And I looked at Dave when they started playing and I said, it, like, remember this, it never gets better than that because you start chasing the cheese through the maze and you start worrying about getting paid and this and right. that. And those guys are up there doing it. And I said to Dave, like, I'm actually jealous right now. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. It, it was awesome. You know, they had the dazzled the band name on the back of their other vest. And they had a big, you know, the big backdrop and, and cool gear. But it was just, it was like the most pure, the most innocent, the most fun they're ever going to freaking have right there. And it's hard to get that through their heads. Yeah. Like, don't yeah. give up. Don't That's give up the dream. Don't forget what you're doing right now. Yeah. Right. 
that's the real rock and roll. That's it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So we want to be, again, respectful of your times. So if we're overkeeping you, please let us know. Um, but one of the things, we're going to talk to Andy and send yeah. you one of our now world famous mm-hmm. Barstools and Bantock mugs. <laughs> what we'll do is we'll. Uh, I love it. You, uh, I'm gonna run up, Sean. We'll I'm gonna buy it. this freaking book tomorrow, and I'm gonna send the book down to you too. Maybe get a little signature on it for us. Hey, what do you think? Do it. All right. Yeah, do we'll it. do that. Do and yeah. uh, all, all anyway. we ask is that you, you send us a picture with the mug. <laughs> you got it. You got it. Um. So, and I always like it's funny because David, we started pretty humble, and we've through the course of this, we've we've had the good fortune of interviewing a lot of people, and I will say without sounding too geeky and funny i i did when i saw hired gun straight up it was like i gotta talk to this man once before i i'm on the other side of the the, the weeds right um but i have a little saying and dave knows it and i say it all the time it's so nice and truly you you were one of my heroes when i was learning how to play it's so nice when you meet one of your heroes and they're not a dick they're a good person and hopefully uh you can appreciate that because this is you know i i, I really appreciate the time you're here tonight well thank you thank you this was great it's a lot of fun we show Thanks a lot, goes sir. Hand, it's the same thing, man. I, it's the same thing. You know, it's like we're fans and we're musicians and we never stop being either one, I don't think. Well, hopefully when this uh, pandemic is the band start playing again and we start touring, then we'll get up there and we'll rehearse. That'd be awesome. We'll have to get you up here for a clinic, sir. Yeah, sure. I'm I hear your clinics, I hear your clinics are, are, are unreal. Are there, uh, a lot. Andy, is- Andy Zildjian told us that they were great. Yeah, well, it's no no bullshit. It's like this is what you do, and this is what you don't do. This is what you don't have to do. <laughs> you know? yeah, we we need a lot less bullshit. It's what we need, man. Is <laughs> that yeah, I look forward to? It. Shit. Yeah, I'm uh, so appreciative of this, and and uh, thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be looking for my cup. Ah, there coming, you go, my friend. We're gonna, we're gonna send you an email to get your office address. And you know what? If the pandemic ain't over soon, I'm gonna be out in the street with that cup. <laughs> <laughs> hey, we'll put some Canadian money in. So it's not worth much, but we'll put some Canadian money in for you. <laughs> put, put, put money in. Like, oh, I don't know about that. <laughs> no yeah. one yeah. knows the trouble. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so right. much. Have a great night. We'll talk again. Thanks yeah. so much, Liberty. A pleasure, Ciao. sir. Ciao. All right. Peace out, Bye. brother.